think we talked a lot about policy and we talked a lot about electricity. And I know that another topic of yours or a dear topic to you is food systems and the created emissions of such. We talked a little bit about it earlier. And also here, I would like to start off with some data. So we said that in 2022 or in 2021, we had roughly 50, 55 gigatons of CO2 emissions. And I found some data that somewhere between 25 and 30% of that accounts for the food industry. So roughly a quarter to almost a third. And I found another interesting data. I found it interesting in our world in data. And those numbers are from 2019. And it says that those 26% of food or 26% of the global greenhouse gases are for food, out of which 18% are for supply chains. And they don't make a differentiation here between vegetables and livestock, but they continue. And 29% of the food industry is for human food or for crops for humans and a staggering 53% is for livestock and fisheries. What do we learn from that? I think most of us know that if we would all eat a little bit more plant-based that would be a good thing but what does that tell us about greenhouse gas emissions in food in relation to yeah meat, fish and vegetables? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, those numbers around the food system sound right to me. It's a, it's a big source of emissions, but it's also, it's not quite like other things where we say like, let's just reduce all the emissions and we need to eat, you know, it's an important, we can't reduce, remove the food sector, but I think we can make it a lot more efficient. And I think you're right that the really, really big lever that we have to pull is meat consumption. Um, if you want to zoom in even more closely yeah, so meat consumption causes a way out, outsized effect on of greenhouse gas emissions on the food system. And honestly, it's really, it's beef. <laughs> it's like, we can, we can zoom in even closer. It's true that poultry and fish are worse than like grains, but we also need, we need protein from somewhere and most protein sources are are more than grains. So anyway, I don't want to oversimplify it, but it's like, it's like great. You have grains, most grains, and then you have rice, which is worse than most grains because of methane emissions from rice patties. And you, if you think of like, and like rice and eggs and cheese are all kind of, and chicken and pigs are all kind of the same, much worse than grains when ours. And then beef is like 10 times worse. You know, so I think we have a major beef problem. And I think that decreasing emission from livestock is just a major, major societal goal that we need to work on. And that's actually a subject of a lot of our current research is what are the pathways really to decreasing emissions from livestock? <clears throat> what can we do as civil society, as nonprofits to try and to try and push that transition faster? I mean, there isn't really a transition happening now, but like to try and push that transition. You know, what are what are the pathways to decreasing beef consumption? And you know, I can speak a little bit more about that, but it's very complicated. And I think there's different levers, right? We can change the diets, we can reduce the food waste in general. We have like maybe improvements in agricultural efficiency. I think there's different ways. And if you talk about technologies or different ways of non-meat proteins, I found another study, and that is from the Cleantech 100 report from the Cleantech group. And it says in regard to the sector, the 2022 cohort, meaning the companies in that sector, signals a change in the alternative protein sector as cultivated and fermented proteins outnumber plant-based alternatives for the first time. The market favors more resource-efficient production systems offering more flexible feedstock and production. What are your thoughts on that? So when you think about the pathways out of meat consumption, um, beef consumption specifically, I... The one that I find to be the most promising is through alternative proteins. 
uh, like you said, you have reduction of food waste, you have just behavioral change of people becoming vegetarians. Uh, you maybe have improving productivity or actually reducing the emissions per cow. We, we've, we've gone down all these pathways and I think that there's prospects in all of them, but I think to me, the realistic route is through technology and through developing alternatives that people like just as much as beef. Um, and so we are quite hopeful about the prospect of the alternative protein industry becoming a real competitor to live animals. Now, the question that you asked about, let's say you could divide the alternative protein industry further into what we call these plant-based versus cultivated. Maybe you have fermented also somewhere in the middle, but there's major, major disagreement within experts of this space about what this industry will look like. I think there are some very smart voices that are very bearish about the cultivated protein market saying that it's there are major technological barriers to scaling and other people disagree with that. So I'm not quite sure where exact, what, which one of the sources the innovation comes from, but I do think that the, there's lots of really good ideas out there and the innovation is coming from many different directions and that it's got to work <laughs> somehow. Maybe that's just the optimist within me, but um, I, I feel, I mean, I'm, I'm still a meat eater despite all of this and I'm trying to reduce my meat consumption and I find it hard. So I like to think that I'm maybe a, like a, myself, I'm an interesting test case. So if you like that, make sure to check out the full length episode here and leave a subscribe. Thank you.